Paul Broca was a French neuroscientist who dedicated a significant amount of his research to phrenology, a study of the correlation between physical characteristics of the skull and qualities such as intelligence. Although this field of study is now discredited, many of Broca's discoveries have proved fundamental to our modern understanding of the way the brain is organized. In 1861, Broca met Le Bourne, a patient whose advanced syphilis had left him with an unusual set of symptoms. Although he seemed to comprehend words spoken to him, he could only respond with the single syllable, tan, accompanied by gestures, and if provoked, profanities. When Le Bourne died of a gangrenous infection later that year, Broca performed an autopsy, finding a lesion in the third frontal gyrus on the left hemisphere of Le Bourne's brain. Eventually, this area came to be known as Broca's area, and Le Bourne's language disorder as aphasia, from the Greek, a meaning without, and phasis meaning utterance. Today, Broca's area has been localized to the premotor cortex in an area just anterior to the section of the motor cortex which controls the movement of speech muscles. Broca's aphasia is categorized as a motor speech disorder with a set of distinctive symptoms. In Broca's aphasia, auditory comprehension, that is, comprehension of the words the patient hears, is relatively good. However, the patient's linguistic output may be extremely limited. Speech is halting and agrammatic, consisting mostly of nouns and a few verbs. Function words such as the are omitted. Patients may also have trouble repeating words back or reading and writing. Additionally, because motor damage from a lesion can extend into surrounding areas of the brain, there is often a weakness or paralysis on one side of the body, conditions called hemiplegia or hemiparesis. The hallmark of aphasia is anomia, an inability to recall words such as the names for objects. Aphasia patients frequently report that they know what they want to say and just can't get the words out. As a result, patients often rely on vague statements, like it's just one of those things, or informative circumlocutions, like four legs, says meow. Though it was the first form of the disorder to be officially discovered, Broca's aphasia is not the only aphasia classification. Each type has its own specific set of symptoms, but all forms share one commonality. Word finding is always impaired. As an ironic side note, although he is famous for being the first Broca's aphasia patient, were he alive today, Le Bourne would probably be diagnosed with global aphasia. Currently, the most common cause of aphasia is cerebrovascular accident, or CVA, better known as a stroke. However, brain tumors can have the same effect. Traumatic brain injury, including bullet wound trauma, is another possible cause. A famous recent case is that of Arizona Representative Gabrielle Giffords, who developed aphasia after suffering a gunshot wound in which the bullet traveled through the length of her left hemisphere, exiting posteriorly. Less common causes include infections and nutritional disorders, although such cases are rarely seen in first world countries. Aphasia is widespread. It is estimated that about 1 million Americans have some form of aphasia, making it more common than Parkinson's disease, cerebral palsy, and muscular dystrophy. Additionally, by some estimates, as many as 38% of stroke patients will develop some form of aphasia. The most common treatment for aphasia is therapy with a speech-language pathologist. She or he may also collaborate with other professionals, such as physical and occupational therapists. A typical therapy session consists of activities intended to improve object naming, grammatical construction, reading, articulation, memory, and attention. In certain cases where articulation or naming is highly impaired, the speech-language pathologist and patient may work together to create an alternative means of communication using pictures, elements of sign language, or in some cases, specially designed computer systems. Such therapy may happen one-on-one -on -one between the patient and speech pathologist, or include a patient's caregiver, or even happen as part of a group therapy environment. Group settings may be especially helpful for patients who feel socially isolated because of their symptoms. While many therapy activities have long histories, several newer experimental techniques have emerged in recent years. Music intonation therapy, or MIT, is a technique based on the common observation that many patients with aphasia can sing with considerably less effort than they can speak. Methods vary, but generally patients are first taught to sing very short words and phrases. Over time, the length of utterances is increased and the reliance on musical melody is decreased. Proponents believe that music intonation therapy helps activate areas of the right hemisphere which assist in language production, and that it allows patients to regain not only basic language mechanics, but also the natural rhythm and intonation we expect in fluent speech. 
As of late 2011, clinical trials are taking place with results expected in the coming year. Constraint-based therapy is an outgrowth of a physical therapy technique in which stroke patients who experience weakness or paralysis on one side had the healthy side of their bodies forcibly constrained, requiring them to develop movement in the weakened limbs. Constraint-based speech therapy works by loosely the same principle. Because patients with aphasia often rely on gestures to communicate, physical barriers are set up so that only speech can be used to complete activities. Practice is generally very intensive, but studies have shown significant improvement among some patients.